asked. Um, to merge with the century, why Canada and America should become one country, um, by the author Diane Francis, a fascinating financial journalist, um, lives her time between New York and Toronto, and I've read her for years and years and years, and it's been a pleasure in the last couple months to really get to know her a little bit, at least know what she looks like in person. So <clears throat> with that, Diane's going to talk about the book for a while, um, and then we'll get in, into a panel. We have some comments on the, uh, the book and her ideas <coughs> and what it means for the larger continent, the larger economy. So you didn't come here to hear me, so I'll turn it over to Diane. Okay, thank you all for uh, finding this place. Of course, if you live here, it's not as difficult as it was for me. I, I'm glad I gave myself extra time. Uh, straight into it. Uh, they wanted me to talk for about 20 minutes. So I'll try and hold myself to that, although I could talk forever about this book. I really enjoyed writing this book. I really love my idea of merging the two countries, if I must say so myself. Uh, and you don't spend four years and do all this research unless it's something that you really enjoy. Um, and so I will explain to you, but I'll kick it off with a wonderful quote that I came across in my research by a, a novelist who won the Giller Prize out of Alberta, Will Ferguson. He, he's a novelist and he's a humorist, and he spent about 20 years in Asia and came back to Canada and uh, came up with this uh, and wrote a very humorous book about Canada. But one of the lines that I thought resonates and still does is he said that the great themes of Canadian history have been about keeping the Americans out, the French in, and hoping the natives somehow disappear. <laughs> Acerbic, but I think dead on. And I'm not saying that, that Canadians internally internalize this, these themes, but certainly the political forces in Canada, the so-called Laurentian consensus that's run the country, certainly ever since I've lived there uh, at, in Montreal, Ottawa, and Toronto, um, to the exclusion of a lot of other folks in the country, uh, have always had that belief. And they have sculpted policies and attitudes in that same way, shape, and form, also inheriting that mentality from the British. And let's not forget that the British uh, that the U.S.-Canada border is essentially the line that the British were able to hold through guile and cunning to keep the Americans out without an occupying force. Uh, and so that's what they did. They signed treaties with Indian bands. They made deals with the French. They brought in mercenaries, and they colonized the place with revolutionary soldiers that consisted of United Empire loyalists, runaway slaves, German mercenaries, and, uh, and British regular soldiers who got 160 acres. Uh, when they demobilized anywhere in the world. So they, they colonized the place with British loyals and, um, and made their deal with the French. And of course, the deal with the French was don't, don't join the Americans in their revolution. We will protect Catholicism. We will protect your right to a language. And in return, you will not fight for anybody. You don't have to fight for us either. And so that's been the sort of uh, pact that the British set up. And we are still living with a lot of the threads and the <coughs> legs as a result of that uh, basic uh, DNA of the country. Took me four years. Uh, reaction has been interesting. It's gained traction in the United States as a foreign policy book. I got a lovely letter from Hillary Clinton, who liked the book very much. Uh, I got a nice note from Jeb Bush. I've been invited to the Perot's uh, to present to their close friends in Dallas uh, things about the book. And uh, I'm speaking to a number of universities and, and uh, around, around the country. In Canada, people are horrified. They're horrified. Uh, again, that goes back to this strain of anti-Americanism that was part of the DNA in the formation of the country and in the governing of the country, and that still exists. And it, it's very offensive to me, because being American is my ethnic group. Uh, and, and uh, I was born in the United States. So those are the things. Now, just to give you the overarching reasons, uh, the existential challenges, the three existential challenges that underpin the reason for writing this book, that this book tries to address. And my bias is declared right up front. I think I'm a merger. I'm American and Canadian. I think the two countries should just merge and get it over with. I think they're already merging. I think it's underway and inevitable. However, I went through a thought experiment to sort of debunk and just to get it out there so people could start to at least not discredit or uh, say that it's impossible and just discount it out of hand uh, in either country. So I wanted to take on the Canadian establishment. I wanted to take on the fact that Americans know very little about, the, about Canada and should know a lot more because we are partners uh, de facto. 
The three existential challenges starting from the top is what I call the new Cold War 2.0. The new Cold War is not military. It is state capitalism, uh, models such as Russia Inc. and China Inc. and Arab Inc. and South Korea Inc. and Japan Inc. Uh, versus free enterprise. And so we see this uh, playing out. Most recently, of course, in the Crimea, that was completely predictable and uh, that's a different topic. But the Cold War is, is a very serious issue and it, it is bearing down on Europe and on the United States and Canada. Uh, it, is, it is our multinationals going out uh, trying to, to conquer uh, markets and living standards against Chinese and Russian and other companies who have at their backs, uh, covering their backs, their governments, uh, either as owners or partners, they're subsidized, they're, they enable them diplomatically, uh, they do all kinds of things uh, to protect them. They're protectionist. For instance, a Chinese company can buy an iconic Canadian oil company, which recently happened, or an iconic agribusiness in the United States, Smithfield's Food, which re recently happened, and we cannot buy their iconic companies, even if we can afford to. So there is a lack of reciprocity. They have fallen, gone th right nicely through the cracks in all of this. This is a constant theme in my writings. And so this is an existential challenge, and they're beating us. They're beating us to oil fields. They're beating us to ore bodies. Uh, many examples in my first chapter called A Dangerous World about mining companies just being confiscated because the Chinese blew into the town. They promised a veto on the Security Council to the dictator. They put, opened a Swiss bank account or whatever they did, and suddenly the mine uh, is confiscated without any compensation. And so we have this kind of thing going on, um, as I say, around the world. And this is a major existential challenge. Obviously, if the United States and Canada merged as the Europeans have, bigger is better in the face of this. And also, it's very important to have a perimeter uh, in mentality around the two countries so that penetration into one can't affect the other uh, against their wishes and against their better interests. Um, Canada has, uh, now Canada has a number of existential challenges which has uh, been, which have been outlined in this book and is also the underpinning for the book. First of all, Canada, with a population of 35 million people, uh, which is relatively small, will not make the G20 cut in 10 years. Uh, and it is the second biggest piece of real estate under which is huge buried treasure that it cannot develop financially and cannot defend militarily. I'm not talking about invasion. But you are talking about the fact that the resources have been targeted by Asian giants. The Russians have declared the Arctic is Russian. Canada really has no way of developing out, <clears throat> building the infrastructure necessary to develop the treasure trove in the Arctic. The Arctic is, is empty, virtually empty. Uh, by comparison, uh, the Russians have, have, are well into development of Siberia, has a bigger population than Canada has many cities larger than Chicago, has 25 seaports, rail, road, industry. Uh, Alaska has at least 20 times the number of uh, the amount of economic activity, three times as many mines, an oil industry that's been developed. We had, could have had an oil industry in the Northwest Territories, and it has not been developed, and we still are waiting for a permit for a pipeline 30 years later. Uh, to come down from the top of the country to markets in the south in terms of natural gas. Now there's an oil strike uh, in the Northwest Territory, so we're going to see what happens with that. But basically you have this existential challenge uh, with Canada. Who's going to develop its resources? And they will be <coughs> developed. The planetary arithmetic dictates that. We can't keep it a park for polar bears even if we wanted to. The other problem with Canada existentially is the brain drain. This has been a historical issue. This is Austria's problem. This is New Zealand's problem. This is always the problem of the little guy next to the big guy that has a much more dynamic economy and a pull factor that is impossible to, um, to, to stop. Uh, and so that is another constant problem for Canada on an ongoing basis. Um, the U.S.-Canada border is another existential issue. The uh, border is, at 26 years after a two-way free trade agreement, worse than it was before. Manufacturing is now starting to leave Canada. I talked to the business community. Uh, um, since I've written this book, the speaking engagements that I've done with 
various sectors of the business community in Canada have leaped. Uh, agriculture, oil, mining, um, logistics, agriculture, they are, uh, agriculture I already mentioned, they are all very upset about the fact that the border is worse than it's ever been and nothing seems to be happening. Uh, I have my second chapter on the binational irritants behind this border problem, but I would submit that the entry to our free trade two-way deal in 94 of Mexico has changed all the focus of the United States into the southern border issues and problems. And so the, if you say NAFTA to an American, you say border to an American, they think Mexico. Uh, they don't think about Canada. And so there is a, a problem in terms of Canada, and I have been arguing for five years or so, that we should have an asymmetrical NAFTA, that we should proceed Canada the U.S to integrate as quickly as makes sense for both countries or as both countries desire, whereas Mexico will be slower or it will stay the way it is. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. Um, this is kind of the way Europe developed. The Southern European countries were brought in later after the Northern were organized and, and so on and so forth. So that is very important that we make that move. Now in 2011, the Security Perimeter Initiative was announced between Harper and Obama and my information tells me absolutely little has happened uh, on that file. We now in Canada have uh, drones guarding much of our border with the United States. This is not overkill. We have a passport requirement that has murdered our tourist industry. Tourism fell by 30% the minute the passport requirement was imposed and it has never come back. That's another industry that likes to have me speak uh, because I'm becoming known as the broken border, broken border lady. Uh, and the, uh, the terrorist uh, issue is a real uh, concern, of course. Uh, there have been incidents. The first Al-Qaeda incident came out of Montreal. The Millennium Bomber fortunately was caught. Um, Homeland Security is a little overly aggressive perhaps on the border. Uh, that's part of it. And uh, there is the other problem, and that is drug interdiction on the, US, on the Canadian side of the border has been very lax, uh, absolutely non-existent in some jurisdictions, namely British Columbia, uh, which has an enormous industry in, uh, in marijuana export, um, which may be legitimized once it's made legal everywhere which probably will happen, but nonetheless, this of course uh, invites in other kinds of unsavory uh, production. And so according to the RCMP website of two years ago, Canada was the largest exporter of meth and ecstasy in the world. And these are set up, these operations are set up in remote places, uh, Manitoba border, British Columbia border, uh, in the in Indian reserves in uh, Ontario and wherever they straddle the border. So we have a real binational issue and we also have a complexity issue. I talk about the Detroit Windsor Bridge problem. This is a, a choke point in the world's most busy uh, trade crossing. Uh, a choke point that is causing a lot of uh, people in the auto parts business to move uh, from Canada to the United States or to boost up their production uh, in, in, uh, in the United States as opposed to in Canada. So this doesn't seem to be resolvable uh, when uh, in actual fact all that needed to have happened was for the U.S. and Canada to expropriate the bridge, pay the gentleman what he, was, he deserved and get rid of the problem. Uh, the, the fact that it's dragged on this long and now Canadian taxpayers are paying two billion dollars to build a highway and a to a bridge that may never be built is, is really a testimony to the fact that our border is broken, the relationship is not what it should be, and it needs tending, and it needs to be fixed very quickly. And again, my solution to fixing the border is get rid of it. And the security perimeter, of course, would do that. The Europeans have done that. They've been able to finesse. It's taken them a long time. Uh, they've been able to finesse um, the fact that they have 28 different cultures, legal systems, healthcare systems, uh, tax systems, and they have no border. And that has, of course, uh, been very helpful economically. So these are the underpinnings for the reason why I wrote the book. My solutions are in the book in the form of a thought experiment, economic models, political models. If someone else can come up with a better, different one, that's great. 
Uh, my guess is that the most likely result will be we probably will get, a, if, if conversations continue in places like this in the United States and in Canada, we can maybe get rid of the border and move toward the next step of free, from free trade, which is a customs union. Um, Caribbean has done that, West Africa has been able to do that, the Europeans have been able to do that, and here are two countries more similar than any of those combined collectively, and we have a border that's getting worse, not better, after 26 years. Um, the, uh, the background for myself is that I immigrated, I'm, I was born and raised in Chicago, I immigrated at 19, I married a British guy, we moved to Toronto, and I have also seen an enormous transformation in the two countries. Uh, not only is the United States a lot different than it was in the late 60s. I mean, you think about civil rights, women's lib, gay rights, uh, the liberalization, more progressive politics, more <coughs> progressive voting patterns, uh, the polling is different and more similar to the Canadian polling on a national basis. Uh, and Canada has transformed. When I moved to Toronto, it was a little British city, very provincial. Uh, the country, and I wrote my first book in 86 about it, was heavily concentrated from an economic point of view. 32 families, dynastic families mostly, uh, five conglomerates and five banks controlled just virtually the entire economy, hiding behind tariff barriers. And they had an unusual and unfortunate access to the political levers of the country. And so that had, and, and I wrote that book, and I exposed that level of concentration of power, and then recommended free trade with the Americans and, of course, the GATT process. And of course, th that did happen, and that has made all the difference. So I wrote a sequel to that book in 2008, Who Owns Canada Now? And I profiled the 75 billionaires and the landscape <coughs> Uh, of at that time, a few have died and gone bust, but um, the, uh, the landscape had completely changed. The wealthy people were in all sectors, conglomeration had stopped, people were specialized, free trade had opened up uh, and created a meritocracy, and I would say that of the 75 billionaires at that point in time, most of them were self-made, not dynasties, and many of them, almost half of them were immigrants who hadn't were not born in the country and uh, had started off uh, very impoverished uh, childhoods. So the country had transformed in, in, a, in two generations in Canada to become more American. It became also much more multicultural than it was uh, in that period of time. And the United States has become a bit more liberal and progressive. And so I so, sort of saw this, um, even though they have become more similar, uh, I would say, going from distance co distant cousins to distant siblings, uh, they are not the same. And I would say that the overriding difference, and I sort of realized this in the writing of the book and also analyzing my background, is that Canadians have, no matter what their ethnic background, a British sensibility. So how you dress, how loudly you speak, whether you brag or not, your manners, your deportment, your inner relationship with other people is very British, irrespective of their ethnic background. Americans are Germanic sensibility. Uh, direct, more direct, more blunt, um, very a terrific work ethic compared to Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, good at manufacturing and engineering and technology. And so that is one of the reasons why Americans, like me, rub Canadians the wrong way. And that is why Germans rub the French and the British the wrong way as well. And so these traits are very interesting. So I looked at the American census figures, and the latest census showed that 18% of all Americans said that they had German background not partial German background, German background, 18%. And so that's 18% of the population excluding Hispanics and African Americans and Asians. So that is a big chunk of the population of the Caucasian part of the population. And I would say that if you included those that were partially German or those who had changed their names because of one of the two wars, from Braun to Brown or from Schmidt to Smith, um, 
or Mueller to Miller, you would find a, a larger swath of, of German uh, background people. And I named a lot of the, in the, in the book, in the foreword, I name a lot of the famous Americans, the American Fred Bush, the American presidents, Obama's mother was half German, Nixon's, and, and all of these, these folks. And this is, this is a sensibility, not, an, not opinions, but a sensibility difference. And uh, that, is, that is another major divide between the two countries in terms of cultural style. Um, the merger is underway. Um, and here are some factoids that I'll give you. And then I'm going to end it here. Uh, three million Americans live full or part time in the United States. Canadian, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, roughly uh, two million Americans, American residents, were naturalized Canadians uh, because you had to uh, choose before '78. That's a rough guess. That's a, very, that's a very large percentage of the Canadian population. Not the same, of course, per percentage as Mexico has, uh, as Mexicans that have immigrated to the United States. In the 20th century, seven million, these are the official records, but who knows the unofficial? Seven million Canadians immigrated to the United States. Uh, the population was about seven million at the beginning of, at the outset of that century. Um, I would say that, again, rough guess, if you ask American residents, uh, if you polled American residents with one Canadian parent, you would get a very large figure. Uh, if you asked Americans if they had a Canadian grandparent, you could get the population of Canada. This includes Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin, who had grandparents who were Canadian. Uh, and so you've got, uh, you've got an enormous reach uh, into the country, and that kind of also is a form of socio-merger. Uh, of course, we know we, we marry, we do business together, we study together, we play together, we invest in one another's countries. We are the largest buyers of real estate personally in the United States, Canadians for the last four years. We are the third largest FDI investor. The Americans are by far the largest. 90% of our exports or so go to the U.S. Canadians buy more products from and goods and services from the United States than the whole European Union combined. Um, so there's this integration. 12% roughly of the Canadian economy uh, is owned by American companies. And of that 12%, it's uh, almost 100% of the manufacturing export uh, sector. It's 50% of the oil sector, a whack of the mining sector. And interestingly, 60% of all the retail dollars on groceries spent in the United States are spent in American stores by Canadians, uh, 60%. And so, that is kind of the, the situation right now. The brain drain continues apace. Uh, about a quarter of a million Canadians get green cards every decade now. That's the population of Quebec City. These things are uh, very troublesome for Canada. And the border thickening, of course, is a real worry. And it's reflected in, in some strains in businesses and, as I say, a readjustment. So those are kind of the big major themes that there is a merger underway. I think a merger of some description is inevitable. And again, to quote from, to change the quote of Will Ferguson, keep the Americans out the French in and hope the natives somehow disappear. My book really is about keeping, letting the Americans into the extent Canada is comfortable with it. Don't worry about the French, they either will go or they'll stay. And for goodness sake, we have to do something about the natives because the land claims are real, unresolved for the most part, and are a real drain and drag on anybody, a merged US, Canada, or Canada developing its resource base. So thank you very much for being attentive, and away we go. We're doing away we go. <clears throat> well, Diane, you've taken us, given us the background of why Canada is like it is now and sort of a little bit why the Americans are the way they are. And I think the German uh, thing is a, is a very interesting thought, something to think about. Um, so you've got us to today. And I wonder if you could just very quickly <coughs> go through some of the scenarios, the might-be's. <coughs> um, 
okay. take a couple of time to do that, that and then we'll get into um, some discussion with our uh, with the panelists. Okay, that's an excellent question. Yeah, there's a couple of flashpoints coming up again that are existential challenges for Canada. Number one is Keystone. Uh, make no mistake, this is not just a pipeline, and a lot of that oil can be tra can be transported by rail. Although the environmental movement is attacking <coughs> that too, and there's some very serious concerns. Everybody has concerning that. Uh, but, uh, and, and the knock-on effects of that is already being felt in the mining and the agriculture business. Canada's grain companies lost big contracts in China recently because their grain isn't being carried by the two railroad roads in Canada in favor of carrying oil. Potash is having the same problem getting out. And so we have, we have some bottlenecks developing. And the Native Ameri the, sorry, First Nations issues are going to be an impediment certainly in building a pipeline from the oil sands to the Pacific for Asia and also across the country. It'll be a First Nations issue, an environmental issue, but also a Quebec issue. And that's the other flashpoint. We have a, an election on April 7th. A very high profile businessman with a lot of credibility has joined the cause, which is in and of itself, not that significant because I think he's got a bit of a tin ear. Uh, like most business rich guys who run for politics, they really don't know how to play the game. And he's already kind of put his foot in it. However, what it means to me is it means that Quebecers of non, non traditional support for separation are coming out of the closet and saying, yeah. So this is, this is, this is a different ball game. Will they win a majority? Yes, possibly. I don't know. Uh, and if they get a nice majority, <coughs> they will go for the third referendum. And will they pull it off this time? They came 20,000 votes from pulling it off 20 years ago. I wrote my sixth book about that, uh, that battle. And so you've got, uh, you've got that, that flashpoint looming and in Quebec, a unity crisis, you've got and if Keystone doesn't happen and the rail option is not an option and the pipelines continue to be a barrier, um, you've, got, you, you've got a situation where Alberta hits the wall in about 18 months. All of the expansion production, which is a, a long-term bet, will start to wind down. And 90% of the jobs created last year in Canada were created in the oil sands by Alberta. Um, the, the, so the, these are some, some very serious issues. The thickening of the border is another serious <coughs> economic <coughs> issue for Canada. So these are, going forward, these are flashpoints. These are going to create a lot of soul searching in Canada and a lot of political revisionism. And sitting out there now, because of my book and all the work I've been doing and promoting it, is that other option, well, let's fast track integration with the United States, and we can eliminate a couple of these problems. No border, Keystone gets built. Okay, then. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we are very happy today, I'm very happy today to have two, well, a series of experts to, to sort of take Diane's ideas and, and run with them a little bit. Our first panel, we've got uh, Michael Geary, who was a fellow with us for a while, and he's continuing on as a global fellow, and Kevin Lees from Suffragio, who uh, has a lot to say as well. So let me turn over to Michael first and see what you have to say, and then Kevin, and then we'll get into some conversation. Sure. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, David, and uh, the, the Canada team here at the Wilson Centre for um, having me here to discuss Diane's book. Um, I have to start by saying that, you know, I'm not American, I'm not Canadian, I'm Irish. And uh, I suppose I feel a little offended that, you know, we don't talk more, or Diane didn't mention more, but all of the Irish Americans currently in Obama's cabinet, including Obama himself. Uh, and we have the pictures of him with a pint of Guinness to prove that he is uh, at least half or a quarter or a third or a fifth or a tenth Irish. Um, my contribution to the book discussion, um, I want to touch upon some of the arguments that Diane mentions in the book. Uh, this case for a merger, um, and rather than agree with the book's thesis that Canada and the United States should merge, I, I will respectfully, respectfully uh, disagree with the position. Um, but I do admit that the book does present a very interesting thought exercise, um, a thought experiment, 
uh, in a world where trade relations are, I suppose, increasingly being, being consolidated, and we see this with TTIP and TP, the, the Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement that are, that are currently being negotiated, I think, from, um, from my perspective as an expert on the European Union and transatlantic relations, um, looking at the idea of integration of a political merger, um, I think what I would like to focus a bit more on is are these models that Diane talks about in the book, um, although it would have been, I think the book could perhaps have benefited a bit more if, we, if, 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 it, if it had developed more on the concepts of the models, like for example, ger a German federal system or the EU or Switzerland and so on. So an appropriate model for Canada and the United States in the absence of an actual political merger where, you know, erasing the border and simply just creating the United States of something. Um, while the European Union in its absolute form today is not one I would recommend, um, aspects of the EU and its policy framework um, certainly I think could benefit um, uh, the uh, Canadian-American relationship. But before I get into more specifics, I think reading the beginning of, the, of Diane's book got me thinking a lot about the 1920s in Europe, because Diane traces some of the early ideas on the issue of, of a merger. Um, and in the 1920s in Europe, it brought to mind, I suppose, um, you know, well, Europe's recent past over the last 100 years, and the many ideas in Europe that were floated um, on the subject of European integration, especially after the First World War, um, a lot of ideas on greater economic and political integration as a result of, um, you know, the, the carnage after 1919. Uh, so between 1919 and 1945, you have a huge amount of ideas floating on how to create this kind of a European, uh, a united European state. Um, to the forefront of this was um, the Austrian politician Richard kudinov kalargi who advocated closer uh, integration. Um, true, his pan-Europa movement, founded in the early 1920s, that strongly advocated the notion of a united European state. And as a movement, it had some very, very notable members, uh, including Albert Einstein, uh, Konrad Adenauer, Sigmund Freud, yes, Germans, Thomas Mann, another German, but also uh, notable French uh, leaders such as Georges Pompidou. But this was an elite-driven exercise, uh, an elite-driven movement that, that did not attract mass, much critical support on the ground. It was a top-down um, uh, movement. I use the terms, in looking at Diane's book, merger and integration, integration somewhat interchangeably. Between the 1950s and the present day, many European countries decided, for various reasons, to give up some, but not all, of their sovereignty in certain policy fields. And much of this has taken place in economic and monetary fields, um, with a great deal more cooperation uh, in the areas of justice and home affairs and in defence and foreign policy cooperation. What emerged out of the many ideas and plans for European integration during the post-1945 period to the present day was the creation of what we have today, the European Union, which is an economic and political partnership, not a political union, of 28 countries. The borders do exist, they're just not manned. Despite calls for decades uh, to create a United States of Europe, that federal dream has long died. Um, the European Union uh, has economic integration without political integration. Uh, Diane mentions this in the book. She talks about um, this being uh, an element of the current crisis. I, I would somewhat disagree there, but nevertheless, the supremacy and legitimacy of the nation state has not been challenged. And federalists are a rare breed in Brussels today. Um, one issue I think uh, that I, I think is important in looking at Diane's book is I would change the term merger and replace it with enhanced cooperation. I think... Um, you sound Canadian. <laughs> um, enhanced cooperation. And I think perhaps the, the book should, should well, of course, in, in light of more recent events, when we're redrawing this map, when we erase the border, we also need to make sure that we give back Alaska to the Russians and then, you know, <laughs> Uh, approach it from that perspective, because I'm sure 
Vladimir will want Alaska back as well. Um, and then we can proceed. But nevertheless, um, the book, I suppose the book talks a lot about the spendthrift, the spendthrift Southern Europeans, alludes to the good Northern um, Protestant work ethic. And I think this is rather inaccurate because after the Maastricht Treaty, the European Union had, um, with the Stability and Growth Pact, set down strict conditions for membership of the single currency. Most countries that ended up in the single currency in 1999, including France and Germany, managed to get into the single currency largely because of creative accounting, shifting pension funds and so on to meet the monetary targets by 1999. Um, so in the 2000s, it was not a case that the European Union had no oversight. It was that the regulators, including the European Central Bank and the national financial regulators, were simply asleep at the wheel. I would therefore argue that enhanced cooperation rather than a merger is the way forward for Canada and the United States. Midway through the book, Diane talks about, or I'm quoting, if the economics of a deal work, then the political planets will align. That theory, I, I argue, hasn't worked in the European Union, and I would, I would wonder how it would work if uh, this was put into place in North America. Um, the Europeans have been trying for 60 years to move towards an ever closer union. That idea has long died. Now we have moved much more into the realm of enhanced cooperation. And I think there is a lot that the Americans and the Canadians can learn from um, certain elements of the European Union. And perhaps the book could have benefited from looking closer at certain elements of this. Um, one area, of course, is justice and home affairs. Diane does mention in the book um, the European arrest warrant, which is really a, an amazing piece of European, indeed international legislation passed after 9-11 rammed through the European Council and the European Parliament, where now any, an individual of any of the member states can be arrested and shipped back to the country that, of the European Union that actually wants them. It's really a phenomenal piece of legislation. And in the, in, so in the, in, in the issue of justice and home affairs and, and common foreign security policy, there's a huge amount that the Americans and the Canadians can do to enhance cooperation. Now, on the issue of foreign common security policy, as we've seen in the last few days in Europe, we haven't been very successful in, in forging a common foreign security policy, largely because the European Union of 28 member states has many countries that are neutral, non-aligned, NATO, non-NATO, and so on, and they all approach um, foreign policy, and then of course, and Germany, I should say, uh, we all approach foreign policy from very different perspectives. Um, but nevertheless, the European, the Americans and the Canadians um, could work on enhancing security cooperation, particularly uh, in terms of um, protecting the Arctic and on the border. One interesting, um, one interesting model that they could also consider in terms of takings from the Europeans is the Franco-German model, where in the Franco-German Treaty of 1963, uh, the French proposed a joint Franco-German ministerial council where the cabinets of both countries would meet twice a year. And this has happened. There's a joint ministerial council held approximately twice a year in the spring and in the autumn. And perhaps this would be a good idea that the, Ger the Americans and the Canadians would sit down, both cabinets together twice a year to discuss issues of common concern. Um, and again, particularly on the issue of security. Um, the border then, of course, yes, post 9-11, the border um, uh, has been a major issue for Canada and America. Um, but again, I would, I would draw their, both their attention and, and again, perhaps the book's attention to the common travel area between um, Britain and Ireland, a travel zone that comprises the islands of Ireland, Britain, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. And the area has internal borders that are subject to minimal or non-existent um, controls. Now, I am conscious, of course, that security in America is defined somewhat differently than security between Britain and Ireland, notwithstanding the troubles uh, in Northern Ireland. But nevertheless, Normally, you can travel between Britain and Ireland. Irish and British citizens can travel with only minimal identity documents. Ryanair does require a passport, but for everybody else, a, um, a driver's license is more than enough. So the maintenance of this common travel area involves considerable cooperation on immigration matters between British and Irish authorities. Neither of those countries, of course, are part of Schengen. But nevertheless, negotiations perhaps on enhanced cooperation within the area of enhanced cooperation um, to include something like a common travel area, um, of course, factoring in post 9-11, I think would certainly be, um, make more sense, notwithstanding the fact, again, that I don't believe a merger actually is possible. 
Um, on the trade side, the book focuses an awful lot on trade, to the, probably to the detriment of any discussion on the politics of integration, the politics of a merger, which I think are far more significant than simply just the world becoming more of a dangerous place, ergo we should erase the border. It seems to me somewhat inconceivable that just because Britain and Ireland share a unique trade partnership that they should merge politically, simply because it makes economic sense. British exports... Britain exports more goods to the Republic of Ireland than it does to the future global leading economies common re commonly referred to as the BRICS. Is this a reason to merge, notwithstanding 800 years of trying to escape the empire? I think not. But enhanced cooperation in the fields of security and free movement initiatives are very useful tools, and perhaps this is the future of uh, Canadian-American cooperation. There are economic threats, for sure, and the chapter on, in the book talking about international threats makes that very clear. My question would be, there, yes, there are international threats, but what about international opportunities? The book doesn't really focus enough on international opportunities. The European Union has dealt with some of these threats themselves, Microsoft, Google, and, and dominance by these multinational companies in the European marketplace, and the European Commission has taken a very, very hard line. Um, has fined many of these companies, you know, billions of euro. So there are international threats. I don't think that we should, you know, uh, take them lightly. But nevertheless, um, uh, there, the, the book, I think, perhaps paints some of a dark picture about the world and, and that America, the, 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 those countries that are not, um, uh, I suppose, arguably not that friendly with the United States or Canada. Um, uh, I would perhaps look at it from a different perspective, that um, not all Chinese investment is bad, not all Russian investment is bad, not all Brazilian investment is bad, and actually that investment is actually quite important. The Europeans are pushing hard for that investment. Um, it seems to me that the Canadians, uh, the book at least presents a picture of this very meek and mild country that clearly is incapable of managing its own affairs and ergo we need to erase the border and get American uh, Germanic thinking um, uh, uh, integrated there. But why not just focus more on proper regulation, right? Regulatory issues dealing with some of these, these wayward, uh, I, and I understand, of course, some of these Chinese multinational companies have links with the government in China, and of course that, that, that provides them with a buffer. But nevertheless, uh, you know, Europeans have true competition policy and true other policy frameworks moved to ensure that there is stricter competition within the single market, to ensure the single market works and there's a free movement of people's goods, services, and so on, capital. So there are multiple models, I think, um, within the European Union that you could actually use um, rather than take uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of a um, more of a global, more of a, a definitive approach to erasing the border. And I think the book, yes, it is an excellent thought experiment. It, it did get me thinking quite a lot on, uh, and I kind of go through the motions between whether I think, uh, you know, could it work or could it not work, or, but then I, I do come down to the hard reality that there is a political impairment that you, do, you, you just do not simply erase borders at the, at the stroke of a pen, that there is, uh, in the European Union, we have gone through two world wars and the legitimacy of, legitimacy of the nation state is still there, notwithstanding economic um, uh, challenges and opportunities and threats and so on. So um, I would say that the issue of enhanced cooperation is more, more um, realistic, more politically realistic than the idea of a actual merger. Well, thank you, Mike. Like, um, <laughs> Diane's book really did get you thinking. Um, okay. Very, very much so. And Kevin, over to you for your thoughts. Sure. Um, so, you know, I sort of look at this book as sort of two books. The, the first book, that's sort of the headline book, is the sort of the, the one that's got everyone talking on both sides of the border. Um, the, the concept of a political merger between the United States and Canada. Uh, and in that regard, I agree with Michael that as of right now, that's completely politically untenable. But sort of hiding in plain sight, I think there's another book, and let's call this maybe 
two or three dozen really, really thoughtful policy ideas that the United States and Canada could implement tomorrow. And I think, you know, the good news is that policymakers on both sides of the border are very much considering those ideas. You know, whether that's the concept of sort of going beyond uh, NAFTA, reducing the costs of cross-border transactions, you know, obviously, you know, bringing sort of the, the scale of U.S. investment into, uh, invest, uh, into uh, the arena of energy cooperation and, um, um, and greater cooperation for you know, developing the resources of the Canadian North. I think that when you look at, you know, one, one of the best examples is uh, water policy. Uh, I was sort of stunned to learn that 60% of the rainwater in North America falls in Ontario and Quebec, um, even though it has just 6% of the population of, of uh, North America. Um, so there, there's an opportunity there, obviously. Engineers and water policy experts believe that, you know, some of that rainwater could be diverted to the United States and potentially double the arable, uh, amount of arable land in the United States. Um, that seems like, you know, in the words of Tyler Cowen, you know, sort of low-hanging fruit. And there's a, there are a lot of examples in this book of the kind of low-hanging fruit um, that, that, you know, both countries would benefit from in sort of uh, Pareto-efficient ways. Um, you know, I think the book makes a, a clear case for erasing the border uh, in, you know, whether that's, you know, enhanced cooperation or, or, or a deeper sort of North American version of the Schengen Zone. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense, obviously. Uh, if you think about, you know, airports today in Canada, um, you know, the infrastructure is almost, is almost there. As an American citizen, you go through immigration not when you come back to the United States, but at Canadian airports, and that's, that's true whether you're in Edmonton or Halifax. So I don't think it would take too much political effort to develop a joint effort between sort of U.S. and Canadian immigration um, officials to sort of develop the capacity of creating something that, that looks like a North American Schengen zone. Um, you know, obviously, you know, as we get further away from 2001 and the terrorist attacks, you know, I think the counterterrorism sort of perhaps even overreaction of U.S. officials will subside in time and U.S. officials will realize that there are, there are plenty of gains uh, to, be, to be reaped from uh, sort of facilitating cross-border transactions and, you know, ultimately free movement of, of workers between Canada and the United States as well. Um, you know, the one security concern obviously is the Arctic, but, you know, obviously anyone who's been paying attention realizes that, you know, over the next two or three decades, the Arctic is going to be a, become an area of, you know, absolute strategic concern, not just to the United States and Canada, but to Russia, to Europe, uh, to China. You know, Chinese officials aren't going to Greenland today because, you know, they have a, developed a sudden interest in Inuit culture. Um, they, they see a lot of resources there. Um, so it's a good time to, it's a, it's, it's a particularly good time to be thinking about these issues, I think. Um, you know, obviously as the United States and the European Union start, you know, really negotiating TTIP, I think that the Harper government has sort of realized that, you know, if TTIP becomes, you know, more than just, um, more than, more than just reducing tariffs to, to the zero, but, but actually breaking down regulatory barriers to trade, Canada stands to lose an awful lot of trade with the United States. And that will be displaced by sort of transatlantic trade between the United States and the European Union. So it's, it's sort of, you can understand why the Harper government was so sort of uh, excited to put CETA into place, their own bilateral trade agreement with the European Union. You know, it's, it's, it's not surprising to see that, you know, Canada is excited about, you know, its role as a negotiating uh, partner in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And I wouldn't be surprised, but, you know, when it's all said and done, if, you know, Canada takes an interest in ultimately joining TTIP as well. So it's a really good time to be thinking about these things. Uh, as we approach the 2015 parliamentary elections in Canada, you know, the front runner right now is Justin Trudeau, and he's going to be looking for, you know, to develop and sort of fill out a policy agenda uh, that includes ideas that sort of position him as someone who's, who's thinking about sort of forward, um, you know, uh, sort of the future of Canada and for sort of forward thinking policies. Obviously, the front runner in the United States for the 2016 presidential election uh, right now seems to be Hillary Clinton. And she's obviously, you know, as well going to be looking to sort of develop a policy agenda that, that orients her campaign to, to the future not just sort of litigating the, the sort of concerns of the 90s and the, and the prior Clinton administration or the current Obama administration. But if we turn to the, to the politics, I think that, you know, the political analysis is, it, it does become more difficult when you add sort of the politics 
um, of, of a potential full-fledged merger between the United States and Canada. And when you start to think of this less as something like an M&A deal and more like, you know, something that would be along the lines of, uh, you know, political negotiation, um, like the Meech Lake Accords or something like that, um, you see very quickly how the politics of this would, would sort of, um, would shut down any serious conversation of a merger. Like, imagine for a moment if, if, the New York Times broke tomorrow that the Obama administration had a white paper on implementing a political merger with Canada. I think you would have, you know, Fox News would go apoplectic for the next month attacking the Obama administration as <laughs> selling out, you know, the United States to, to, to Canada and, and paying Canada a price, uh, you know, this, this lump sum payment for the privilege of doing so. Um, but there, you know, as, as, as Diane and Michael have, have alluded to, there are, there are many cultural differences. Uh, between the United States and Canada, so you know, you know, obviously, you know, the the difference between the British, uh, the Britishness of Canada and the Germanicness uh, of the United States, uh, and the Irishness of the United States. Um, you, you think about, you, you know, New Jersey, for example. It's incomprehensible to understand governance in New Jersey without thinking about Italian Americans. It's incomprehensible to think about an American culture, art, and music without thinking about the influence of African Americans. So there are these fundamental differences. And if, if we think about it in a sort of greater theoretical way, you, know, you have to sort of turn to Seymour Lipset, who you know, famously wrote you know, years ago that the big difference between Americans and Canadians is that the United States was founded in revolution and Canada was founded in evolution. And I think that, that, that goes not just to politics, but the fundamental culture differences of both countries. And so you know, the way that Canadians approach the role of the state, for example, or you know, institutions of government is very, very different than the way that, the United, you know, that, that Americans do. Um, so you know, when, you, when you think about, you know, I, I sort of, you know, that, that being said, um, I sort of go back to the internet meme from around 2004 after the, the, the re-election of George W. Bush, and there was a map going around that showed, um, you know, California, so the West Coast uh, and part of the East Coast, uh, and, and Illinois breaking off and joining with Canada to be the United States of Canada, and then the rest of it was just Jesus land, it was just sort of shorthand for the, you know, cultural, socially, and economically conservative um, and sort of political heartland uh, in, in the United States that was very much more supportive of uh, the Bush administration than, than the rest of America. But I think that's, you know, that's sort of lazy thinking because, you know, as Diane mentioned, the United States has shown, you know, in the election of Barack Obama in 2008 that it's not, that it's, that it's, it's willing to endorse, it's willing to, to vote for full-throated uh, full American liberalism. Um, you know, if you look at what political scientists have to say, they, they believe that the millennial generation is going to predominantly and sort of uh, disproportionately vote for Democrats, uh, you know, for, for the coming decades based on past voting trends of prior generations and sort of how generations lock into voting patterns at a sort of relatively early age. Um, obviously, the changing ethnic and racial composition of the United States, um, just like in Canada, is, is sort of shaping politics in new ways. And you don't have to believe that you know, ethnic and racial minorities in the United States will continue voting for the Democratic Party in the same you know, high numbers as they do today to, 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 to realize that you know, the Republican Party may have to shift somewhat uh, toward the center or toward the left in order to, to regain power. Um, and the same token, in the same token, Canada has sort of shifted rightward a little bit over the past 30 years. Um, if you look at Alberta, I think Alberta today probably has much more in common with Wyoming than it does with Quebec. Um, it's the fourth, you know, most populous province in Canada. Um, in, the, in the sort of, in terms of provincial politics there, the choice is between the right and sort of the far right. In terms of the, the contest between sort of the progressive conservatives who have been in power for over four decades and sort of the upstart Wild Rose Party, which is much more economically conservative, much more socially conservative. Uh, in fact, a lot of people have sort of compared it to the American Tea Party movement. And there's some, some, there some commonalities there, but it's definitely a much more um, robust prairie conservatism than, than, than anything you would ever have seen from sort of the, the old Toryism of the progressive conservatives in the 1960s. Um, if you look at Saskatchewan today, you know, the Conservative Party linked up with some more center-right members of the Liberal Party to form the Saskatchewan Party, and it's, it's been in power for, I think, seven years now. And in the last election, it won 64% of the vote, and it, I think it has, uh, 
five, six of the seats in the Legislative Assembly in Saskatchewan. If you look at what Stephen Harper has done over the past decade, you know, he took two disparate, you know, conservative traditions, you know, sort of birthed them into a, uh, to a merged conservative party, then he made that party competitive, then he won a minority government, and now he's won a majority government. So, um, you know, it's, it's, Canada is, is, is not necessarily you know, the bastion of uh, liberalism or socialist health care death panels that many Americans might as assume it would be. Um, another, you know, another great book that was re released last year called The Big Shift uh, by the Globe and Mail reporter um, uh, John Ibbotson and Daryl Bricker, who's a, a pollster for Ipsos, they argue that this Laurentian consensus is coming to an end. And that, you know, in the 21st century, it's going to be a lot easier for uh, conservatives in Canada to win, to assemble a majoritarian electoral coalition. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, obviously, you know, they point to the growing, the sort of growing importance of Ontario. Uh, they point to the sort of entrepreneurial spirit of the, uh, the you know, very much growing immigrant class in Canada. And, you know, I think that you know, when you look at the 20th century, you know, the liberals were in power 69 of, of, of out of 100 years. That's just two years shy of the record of the pre in Mexico. So if you're, if you're making bets, I think it's probably safe to bet that the liberals aren't going to repeat that record in the 21st century. So that's probably a safe bet. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, when, when, when you think about the politics of a, of a merger, you know, maybe the difference between, you know, the United States and, and Canada is, is much less than we think. That being said, I, I do agree with, with, with the book that the, the, um, the two most recalcitrant opponents um, of a merger are conservatives in the U.S. South and, uh, you know, sort of liberal, um, sort of statist uh, separatists in Quebec. Um, but, but when you think about sort of the, when you sort of go through the thought experiment of the political analysis of, you know, how you might bring these groups to the table, I think that, you know, when I started thinking about it, I think that it might actually be easier to bring conservatives into a deal like this. When you think about, you know, sort of, um, if tomorrow we created a super Congress of the United States of Canada and America, and you just sort of smushed together the House of Commons and, you know, added those 301 writings to the United States House of Representatives, you know, it, not only would sort of the Republican conservative coalition sort of still have a majority, they would increase that majority. Because right now, obviously, you know, Harper's conservatives control 100 and, I think, 161 seats in the House of Commons. And combined, the liberals and the you know, slightly more progressive NDP control, I think, 135. So, you know, there, there are, there, you know, it's, it's, it's not sort of, I think, an assumption that a lot of Americans would make. It's not true that a merger between the two countries would necessarily uh, you know, sort of doom conservatism. There are a lot of good arguments that it could strengthen conservatism and, and sort of the moderation of the Conservative Party in Canada might actually um, make the, the Republican Party in the United States uh, uh, much more electable. I think if you look at the state level, um, a lot of governors would uh, obviously, you know, look to provinces and say, gosh, you know, I'm a little bit jealous of the power and the autonomy that provinces have. I'd sure like to have their budgets. Um, you know, so you think about the differences between, you know, the Mormon governor of Utah, Gary Herbert, trying to have a conversation with, you know, the, the first openly LGBT premier of, Ontario, of, of Canada, Ontario's Kathleen Wynne. You know, there are a lot of cultural differences there. Um, you try to imagine a conversation between someone like Texas Governor Rick Perry and Quebec Premier um, Pauline Marois. I'm not even sure that you know, it, his French and her English are good enough for them to have a really substantive conversation. So there are really big, there are really big obstacles here. But on the same token, you, you, you sort of, if, if, you, if you dig a little bit deeper, you think, well, you know, Texans uh, among Americans, you know, off, many Texans think of themselves as Texans first, you know, Americans as a close second, in sort of the same way that the Quebecois think of themselves as, you know, Quebecers first, French speakers second, and you know, Canadians last. But, you know, obviously that manifests itself much, much differently um, politically and, say, culturally. Um, but, but, but folks like, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, Rick Perry and folks like Nikki Haley and other conservative governors in the South wouldn't mind having, you know, some sort of concept of the notwithstanding clause in, in you know, the whatever constitution would emerge in a political merger, right? So I think there are chips on the table that could induce U.S. conservatives to join a merger. Much more difficult, I think, is the issue of Quebec. And, you know, I, you know 
Obviously, it's in the middle of an election campaign right now. And Pauline Mawa uh, announced on, I think, March 5th, snap elections. And the conventional wisdom just a few days ago was that she was going to easily win a, uh, a majority government on the strength of this debate over sort of a, a cultural wedge issue, the Charter of Values. Well, now the, the, the sort of um, conventional wisdom has now been upended, right? There was a poll yesterday that showed the Quebec's Liberal Party two points ahead. And obviously, with the introduction into the race of this, this uh, new businessman, uh, pierre Carl Pelado, um, it sort of you know, reintroduced the idea of sovereignty. It's made this, this election, you know, as long as the narrative you know, remains the same over the next sort of two weeks, this is going to be an election more about sovereignty, more about independence than any provincial election, probably since the 95 referendum. Um, I think that a lot of uh, Canadian Federalists thought that Marois represents sort of the last gasp of this generation of Quebecois leaders like uh, Lucien Bouchard, Jacques Perizeau, Gilles Duceppe, that sort of came of, um, came of age during the Quiet Revolution in Quebec in the 1960s, and that the independence movement would sort of die out um, just as soon as they were, you know, as, as soon as this generation sort of leaves, leaves power. But I think that's, that's more wishful thinking than anything else, and I think that um, you know, to think about a merger between the can Canada and the United States is sort of audacious when, you know, sort of the merger between English and French Canada has sort of been fraught for the past 350 years. So this is an issue that, 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 that didn't go away with the end of the French and Indian War. I don't think it's an issue that's going to go away, go away now. And if you look at, it, uh, at a figure like um, Pelado, he was born in 1961. He is a bit younger. Um, it's, it's, it, you know, he represents sort of the new generation. If you look at, you know, someone like Xavier Dolan, a young filmmaker in Quebec, he thinks of himself as a Quebecois filmmaker first, not a Canadian filmmaker, and he's, you know, sort of a very strong supporter of the PQ. Well, he's only 24 years old. He was just a toddler um, at the time of the last referendum. So I think that, you know, the idea of, you think about how much Canada federally has had to give to Quebec over the past, uh, you know, sort of you know, half century in order to maintain a union between Quebec and Ontario and the rest of Canada, just think how much that, you know, the sort of merged superstate of the United States and Canada would have to give to keep it in a, in a you know, sort of a, a political merger with Texas and South Carolina. Now, obviously, it's not, it's, it's no longer 1980, it's no longer 1995 in Quebec or in Canada, you know, as, you know, the bicultural question in Canada has now become a multicultural question. So, you know, as we, you know, as noted, Toronto is incredibly diverse, Ontario is incredibly diverse, the amalgamated Toronto, half of the population there is foreign born today, um, over half. If you go to British Columbia, you know, 25% of the population speak neither French nor English, but a third language. So, you know, Canada has changed, and I think that one of, the, one of the issues now is sort of on the other side of things, the rest of Canada may be sort of losing patience with the Quebecois question as well. Um, so, you know, you, if you look down the road, and if, you know, Quebec ultimately separates from, from, from Canada, um, you know, maybe that becomes, you know, maybe there's a new opportunity to talk about political merger. So, you know, all of a sudden you would have, you know, perhaps conceivably, you know, sort of Western Canada and Ontario, geographically separated from you know, the rest of Atlantic Canada. And so you have to wonder, well, maybe there's an opportunity there for political, uh, political merger. And you think back to the 1940s when Newfoundland was sort of thinking about its status. And for a brief, for a brief period, you know, there was a very popular movement for Newfoundland to join the United States. That ultimately didn't happen. But I think a lot of those questions would sort of return um, if, if you know, Quebec actually does pursue independence and we're looking at a post-secession uh, Canada. So today, I think that obviously political merger between the two countries doesn't work. But the good news is there are you know, a ton of great policy ideas in here that, you know, don't, even that, that don't require political merger um, that could be implemented tomorrow. That would be low-hanging fruit for, for both countries. Thank you, Kevin. Well, Diane, as you can see, you've got us thinking. Um, Kevin and uh, Michael thought a lot. You want to... React. Yeah, just, just quickly, and, and we're going to take questions then, or have a break, or? I think we'll s switch things up, get you guys in, and then we'll have a free for all. Okay. A um, couple of things uh, that I wanted to say is that the sixth chapter of this book explains how the politics make, makes it impossible to merge and why. Um, but the regionalization of the two countries is very important. It's very, um, uh, I think, inappropriate to characterize a Canadian or an American 
a uh, little back of the envelope uh, calc I did recently was if I looked at, and we know that the border states and the ones I did, I did uh, all the, I crunched all the numbers of the presidential cycles going back to 92, and, it, and the, the, the votes for Democrats at the presidential level back to 92 of those states represents varied for between 60 and 65 percent of the economy of the United States, voted Democratic, back to 1992. So the progressiveness is happening. But I looked at uh, the six New England states, the five Pacific uh, Northwest, so-called, uh, and Minnesota and Wisconsin that are clearly uh, progressive uh, states in terms of their voting patterns federally. Uh, they have a population roughly of Canada's, 36 million, and their laws and crime rates are the same as Canada's. So you have another little mini Canada, if you like, <laughs> on the U.S. side of the border. And um, the outlier regions, and as I talk about it in the book, the Republicans, you know, joining up uh, like the Germans did, uh, where you just merge, uh, you could make allowances for Quebec as a commonwealth rather than a state, but this is only going to happen as it only happened in Germany quickly because of a crisis. And the unity crisis is, is, is possible if there is a referendum that's successful. Uh, we do have, therefore, the conditions for a great deal of soul searching. And one of the ideas that I posit here is that Canada, in regard, in relationship to the United States, <coughs> has the same attitude, a colonial attitude, as Quebec has toward Canada. And that is, they do a lot of whining, we really don't like you, we're really not the same, we're a little better than you, a little smug, uh, but we're not prepared to go on our own uh, yet or defend ourselves. We can't defend ourselves, but we'll rely on you, but we'll resent you. And I think that much of that same attitude has been adopted in the English Canadian, if I can call it the English speaking Canadian part of Canada toward the United States. Eh, we're a little better than you, we're a little smug, we really don't like you, we don't want to be part of you, but you know, thanks very much for your Navy and your Air Force and NORAD. Uh, because we have a Navy with 8,500 people in it and the biggest coastline on the planet. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that could really suddenly swirl around and change minds. And, you know, the, the I, I don't want to even say that's going to happen, but we don't know what's going to happen. This is called merger of the century. We have a lot more years in the century. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's already kind of inevitable. And on the political side, I just want to say I'm a conservative small C in Canada. I'm a conservative spokesman. I'm the guru of the reform party merging with the, with the progressive conservatives. I'm a conservative. I am left of the Democrats in the United States. So uh, there is that, that other, other difference uh, when you're looking at anything political in Canada. It is left, left, and lefter uh, compared to the U.S. and never the twain. But then again, on the other hand, if you look at the northern tier states, the border states, and those states that vote Democrat in the presidential cycles, you see on polling, which I have in the sixth chapter, the polling on everything from capital punishment, same-sex marriage, legalization of marijuana, uh, even gun control is very similar uh, nationally, U.S., Canada, and this is interesting. And of course, it's mostly coming from the border, border states, the tiers, which, which are the richest, most educated part of the country. But that's my bias showing. Okay, we're going to make some room for the other guys, and then they're going to give short presentations, and then we'll get into a bigger conversation here. So if uh, Michael and Kevin don't go far, just sort of pick a seat there, and I'll shift a little Okay. <clears throat> Next up is part of the conversation. We have. I'd be pleased to be Ms. Michael Wilson. Geary, but I couldn't pull it off. Well, it's no, close no, to no. St. Patrick's Day, my goodness. No, no, no. Chris yeah. Kent Hughes. Thanks. Kent. Yeah. Thanks. There we go. <laughs> My colleague Chris Wilson from the Mexico Institute and my colleague Kent Hughes, who formerly wore many hats at the center. The latest, I think, was the director of Celtic Studies here. Um, <laughs> so uh, with that, their bios are in the sheets there, and I'll turn it over to Kent. 
Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Diane, for, as everyone has said, a very thought-provoking book. And I, I, someone with cousins in Brampton, just outside Toronto, I see this sort of easy connection that so many Americans do have, and I, having been identified as a former head of the Celtic Studies, I do have to raise one eyebrow about this German sensibility that uh, I was, uh, being of Welsh descent, I was considerably disappointed not to see more emphasis on the enormous role that the Welsh have played in it, coal and steel and, and of course many presidents being a whole or in part of Welsh descent. Well, I, uh, I really did enjoy the book. I did find it thought-provoking because it not only got you thinking about where two very close neighbors might be going in the future, but also you took a look at a number of other federal systems around the world. And you have, you have India, you have Canada, you have, in a sense, a federal system, despite what Michael said, being uh, emerging, I think, over time in Europe, looking at Germany with a federal system. What can we, the U.S., learn about improving our own approach to federalism? Well, I was asked not to talk so much just about could there be a merger, but let's assume the merger has taken place. How does this affect the United, the, the United countries, and how does it affect that united group going forward in, in terms of its global role? Well, I think the, the impact would be in many ways much more political than it would be initially economic, that Canada is about 10 percent of the United States. That would be significant. I think you're right. There would ease the flow of uh, investment capital going into developing uh, raw materials. But I think the, a, the significant impact would be in not just being more Democrats, possibly, or more conservatives, but a somewhat different sense of community, that probably this merged country would find it easier to move toward, let's say, truly universal health care. And in some ways, that merger, that move to universal health care, would, I think, improve the soft power of this combined country. That one of the things that uh, shocked people with the uh, financial crisis and the sudden focus on America was not only that we had messed up what had been a really point of pride for the United States, but suddenly people realized with the Obama administration we did not have universal health care. We were alone in the OECD world, and people thought, well, gee whiz, is that really a city on the hill where they don't even have health care for everyone? The second impact, I think, would be possibly pushing us back toward our pragmatic roots. That uh, in Diane's book, she really does note that in many ways our current policies ignore our much more pragmatic past. Uh, you go back, for example, to Abraham Lincoln, who in the middle of the Civil War stimulated the development of the railroads and created the whole land-grant college system. Many of those land-grant colleges are now what they call tier one research universities and the source of an enormous amount of innovation. You have the example, of course, of the GI Bill. You have Eisenhower building the interstate highway system, which kind of acted in a, a way like the common market in Europe, that, that ease of transportation helped knit what were still largely regional economies together. So I think moving us back to that pragmatic past, that shared pragmatic past, would make it easier to respond to one of the things that Diane emphasizes, which is the need to respond to what I would call the East Asian miracle countries. Started with Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, China now being the latest example of countries that have thrived by building on a different set of assumptions than those that under, underlay the initial GATT when it was from the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which more or less assumed, that period being right after World War II, you were going to have relatively limited government intervention and essentially free competition among private companies. Clearly, the East Asian countries have found a different formula, which has worked well for them and perhaps not always as well as they confronted a very different GATT-like system here in the United States and Europe and some other places. 
Uh, I think that you do want to think of these very different sensibilities. One of the Oxford histories of the United States refers to America as the restless giant. I don't get the sense that Canada is as restless as we are. Uh, we tend to be a mobile country. It's uh, Los Angeles, opportunity, let's give it a shot. Uh, and that uh, element that uh, Diane emphasizes, the culture of risk taking, where if you're in Silicon Valley, failure is basically not trying again. And you hear lots of people who will say, oh, didn't work, didn't work, made it on my sixth try, that kind of thing. And that sense that uh, there's no shame in failure, that really is the shame of not trying again. And that would be something that would be perhaps a bit of a shock to Canadians, although less so than we think, hence the brain drain. People have seen that opportunity here, and those restless people have certainly uh, come here. I gave just one minute of thought to steps that might move us to what uh, Michael so eloquently referred to as enhanced cooperation. One, that we could have a much more unified travel system. We could start partnerships among universities in which there could be much greater exchange. There could be, of course, and this thinking was stimulated when Quebec flirted much more seriously, or maybe they will again, with leaving, and people saying, well, what if Alberta wanted to join, or what if Saskatchewan wanted to join? And there was not very serious thinking, but a view here, naive, uninformed, will be better informed thanks to your book, of saying, well, the provinces are sort of like states, what's the problem? coming from Pendleton, Oregon, which is famous, feels it's famous for the Pendleton Roundup, one of the biggest rodeos in North America, we feel an easy comradeship with our co-rodeo uh, fans in Calgary. So there would be a, a, a sense that this would not be uh, so, uh, so hard. I think that we would probably benefit from a shared pragmatic thinking about foreign direct investment. Uh, one thing I noticed in your book, you had a lot of emphasis on raw materials and agriculture and uh, energy. Well, one of the biggest challenges, I think, for us going forward will be investments in the technology sector. Because in the end, if country A and country B have come in and bought a lot of your uh, petrochemical uh, industry, and there suddenly is tension with countries A and B, you can send in the the, the Mounties or send in the Marines and re-nationalize that. But with technology, it can go immediately. So I think that would stimulate a kind of useful shared uh, thinking. And of course, Congress uh, could, in theory, create a common citizenship that it wouldn't be guaranteed in the Constitution, but Congress could, for instance, decide that individuals who had emigrated here uh, when they were children could be granted citizenship and the same approach could be taken and perhaps on a limited basis with regard to Canada. With regard to monetary union, that would certainly be possible. Other countries use the dollar and I don't see any reason why the Fed couldn't meet more regularly with its counterpart in Canada and perhaps if there really were a full merger, you'd have another uh, one of the members of the uh, the uh, Federal uh, Open Market Committee. Well, let me just turn to your final push about merge like Germany, govern like Switzerland, and think like China. China. I think you have to remember that Americans have a real reverence for the Constitution. We really believe that we have, we have inherited rights. And that changing that Constitution is certainly possible. It has been amended a very few times. But that would be a challenge for the German approach. In terms of Switzerland, suggesting another layer of government will have a visceral negative reaction in the United States. We've got enough government would be the, the overwhelming reaction. But you're thinking about China. If I interpret your thinking about China is that it's about time that we had a North American strategy with regard to growth, innovation, manufacturing, and so forth. I think there's some real wisdom to that suggestion. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kent. And now, Chris. Thanks, David. And thanks to the Canada Institute for the invitation to take part in the event. 
Uh, congratulations, Diane, on a very interesting and clearly very thought-provoking book. Uh, I think that maybe it can best be understood as more of a, rather than a, a policy idea, a, a policy provocation, uh, and, and clearly it's worked in that effect on us. Uh, so I, I think that I'll, uh, as such, respond in kind and be a little bit provocative in my response uh, coming from the Mexico Institute, thinking about where Mexico's role might be in, uh, in North American integration. But, but first, a, a broader reflection. When I first uh, started thinking about this book and how to respond and, and talk about it here, I wasn't sure how seriously to take the idea, right? I wasn't sure how serious of a proposal it is, uh, more of a thought experiment in the you know, theoretical conceptual sense or in the let's put this on the table sense. And so I went and tried to do a little bit of reading uh, of how you've talked about the book before. And I found actually that, that for the most part, you're, you're you propose it in a, in a serious way, uh, but at the same time, I found this passage in an interview with the Wall Street Journal that, that I thought was pretty interesting. And he said, if the book does nothing else, it starts a conversation in the two countries centering on how important they are to each other, which is very often forgotten. We, we've got to make Americans realize that one of their best future strategies for jobs, energy independence, security, is to be nice to their neighbors and make them happy. A and I, I actually, I, I really agree with that. I mean, I really think that one of the really important contributions that this book makes is putting on the table, putting in the conversation, in the political discussion here in the U.S., uh, in, in really discussions everywhere in the U.S., just how important our relationships with our neighbors are. Uh, I think you can't overstate it. I mean, it's just so clear on an economic sense, as, as you demonstrate throughout the book, how important those relationships are, but in a security sense also. Uh, and, and even the depth of cultural ties, I think, are extremely important. So I, it, we, we need in the United States to understand that even though we're a big country, much bigger than our neighbors, our relationships with our neighbors are just fundamental to our security and economic prosperity. Uh, and, and I think this book contributes quite a bit in, in that direction. Um, about the role of Mexico in the North American community, you know, one, one thing that you said in, in the book uh, that felt very provocative to me was that Mexico should have never been allowed to join NAFTA. Um, and I have to, of course, take issue with this, being from the, the Mexico Institute and looking so much at U.S.-Mexico relations. Um, you know, as a point of historical clarification, it actually wasn't that Canada and the U.S., who did have the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement before NAFTA, it wasn't that they allowed Mexico to join. That's not what happened. Mexico approached the United States to create a free trade agreement bilaterally with the United States, which was accepted. And then Canada decided that it couldn't be left out, actually. It was a worried that, that perhaps something better would take place there or that they would be excluded somehow from the conversation if they didn't then join trilaterally. Uh, with, with the other two countries to, to form this North American community, uh, which was, of course, a great idea. Um, and, and really, in the intervening years, so, so however we feel about what happened then, in the intervening years, some really important things have happened, and, and that is that our countries, the, the three countries of North America, have really become deeply integrated in a way that wasn't the case before NAFTA. Uh, and, and manufacturing is the best place to see this, right? So. You know, we now have systems of co-production where we ship parts and materials across the borders multiple times as goods are being made. The auto sector is, is really 100% integrated. It's a North American production platform that we have right now that involves all three countries. Uh, you know, the, if, you, if you look at the percentage of U.S. content in final goods being imported from Canada and Mexico, they're unlike imports from anywhere else in the world. And from Canada, there's 25% U.S. content in final good imports into the U.S. The only country that has a higher degree of U.S. content in it, in its imports in front to the U.S., is Mexico, with 40% U.S. content in them. So we, we really are deeply integrated. Um, but that means, that, that deep level of continental integration that NAFTA has created means that we would really uh, go wrong if we didn't deeply consider how Mexico fits into the equation looking forward in terms of the prosperity, in terms of the security of the United States. And I think that, you know, coming from a Canadian perspective, uh, and I realize that you have both a Canadian and American perspective uh, naturally, but coming from a Canadian perspective, it's very easy to dismiss Mexico as a complicating factor in the discussions about regional integration. Uh, but coming from an American perspective, it's really vital to include Mexico in discussions going forward about regional integration. Um, why? Uh, a, few, a few reasons. Um, 
Mexico, it, it okay, I, I, let, me, let me just lay out a few. Uh, Mexico is a, a gateway to the rest of the Americas. Um, so Mexican migration to uh, and from the U.S. is now actually at net zero, meaning there are as many Mexicans leaving the United States, going back to Mexico as there are entering the United States. This may change a little bit over time, but it's, there, there are really some broad, big picture trends that are, that are changing the nature of migration. What that means is that Mexico is becoming largely a pass-through country, that, that uh, Central Americans in particular right now, but people from other nations are using as a gateway to access the United States. This has tremendous strategic importance to the U.S., and of course the U.S. therefore has tremendous interest in cooperating with Mexico uh, on issues of transmigration and migration. Um, you know, a partnership obviously would be able to address issues of transnational organized crime, which is fundamental to the United States and our security. Uh, in terms of trajectory, uh, you know, right now Canada is the United States' largest trading partner. Uh, Mexico is the number two export market for the United States, but Mexico is a nation of 120 million people, much bigger than Canada, uh, growing at a slightly faster rate than Canada. Uh, I think within the next couple of years, we'll see that Mexico is trading more with the U.S. in terms of the auto industry than Canada is. Uh, probably within the next decade or so, trading more with the United States than Canada writ large, period. Uh, so in terms of U.S. interests, there's actually tremendous reasons to make sure that Mexico is a part of the discussion from a trade perspective. Um, you know, recently passed energy reform in Mexico will, over the course of several years, increase Mexico's participation in helping meet North America's energy needs. One in ten Americans are of Mexican ancestry. You know, 35 million Americans have Mexican ancestry. I don't think that that fact can be ignored in thinking about the politics of integration. And, and really, the, one of the challenges for Canada in finding relevance here in Washington uh, is something that Mexico doesn't face largely because of the electoral dimension of how, you know, even now trips by the president to Mexico are considered domestic political opportunities as much as they are opportunities to, to change foreign policy. Um, you know, and so while, while there's some elements of the Beyond the Border project that are unique to the U.S.-Canada relationship, there are many aspects of U.S.-Canada relations that are perfectly mirrored on the U.S.-Mexico side. Uh, things like the high-level regulatory cooperation councils uh, mirrored there. You know, the 21st century border initiative is not the same as the Beyond the Border initiative because it's, the goal is not to create perimeter security, but many of the elements are very similar in terms of trying to both have security and efficiency at our borders at the same time and finding ways to deal with these post-9-11 border challenges. Uh, and there, there's really a lot that the two can learn from one another in terms of best practices and ways to manage these asymmetric, challenging relationships with the United States, but hugely important relations with the United States. And, and recently at the North American Leaders Summit, when the three leaders were in Toluca, Mexico, one of the things that they did that would, was not noticed by mer very many people was agree to send representatives to one another's meetings. Uh, it wasn't clear exactly which ones these would be, but something like a Mexican representative at the Beyond the Border meetings, uh, perhaps a Canadian representative at the 21st century border meetings. This is great. I mean, what, what this is, is this is a realization that we can actually have an asymmetric NAFTA, like you say. We can actually, we don't have to, we don't have to wait with one country or the other to move forward. That's fine. That, that makes perfect sense. If there are things that the United States and Canada can do today that the United States and Mexico cannot do today, no problem. We should move forward with them. Absolutely. But we should not, we, but, but in order for that to work, in order for dual bilateralism to function without tearing apart what we've created in North America, we need to ensure that we're on the same track. And the only way to make sure that we're on the same track is to have a strategic vision. We need a roadmap about where we're going. And that roadmap has to be continental, meaning it has to include Mexico. We need a roadmap that strategically understands where the United States, Mexico, and Canada are all trying to get to together. It could be a long-term project. And then, but actually only then, will it be strategically valuable to let one side get ahead of the other. Uh, so it doesn't happen in a way that's divergent, but rather convergent in the long term. Um, so that, that's, that's the slight shift, and I think that it does fit into the way that you were describing things, but the slight shift that I would, that I would take on it. Um, unfortunately, Canada-Mexico ties are the weakest link in North American relations today. Uh, the, part of that's natural. The, the level of trade and economic ties between Canada and Mexico have been much lower from the beginning uh, and continue to be much lower. Um, 
but, but it also has to do with this attitude in Canada that Mexico contaminates its relationship with the United States. It has to do with this attitude in Canada, perhaps even uh, a little bit of jealousy about the level of attention that Mexico gets in Washington uh, compared to Canada. A and I think that that is really holding back what's possible at the trilateral level. A and the truth is there's a lot of possibility for movement at the trilateral level. And right now, Canada is the one that's holding things back. Uh, you know, there, there has not always been in the United States a willingness at the top levels to move forward trilaterally, uh, but right now there is, and there certainly is in Mexico. Uh, and what we saw in the most recent North American Leaders Summit is that it was really uh, reluctance on the Canadian part that's the, the biggest sticking point to advances trilaterally. So I really think that we got to change that attitude so that we can advance further trilaterally, and then at the same time still allow dual bilateralism to, to move things forward on different tracks. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Anything you want to say, Diane, before yeah, just we... Just quickly, um, yeah, I, I talk about asymmetrical. Uh, the decoupling uh, is, is uh, the security perimeter talks. That's the beginning of the decoupling, and there's about seven different steps toward full political union that countries can take. And I'm just saying that we're stalled at number one, all three of us. Canada and the U.S. can go to two or three. Mexico maybe eventually if, if, if the planet's aligned for Mexico. Um, the security perimeter, again, also related to what you're saying and something that you brought up about the EU, is it regard, it's very tricky to do because it, it inv involves uh, a blending of immigration, tax, customs, and law enforcement and, and security, national security policies and so this is what is go this is why I think it's been very difficult it's not a front burner issue in Washington there's a lot of other things going on and so I think that this is this is really what we should all in the policy world if we agree should be having conversations about to push and um, and so Mexico is is it's not about turning their back on my on a, a back on Mexico. I'm interested, and I'll talk to you later, as to some kind of, you're, you're saying there's some kind of official Canadian position that is a little bit negative toward Mexico in terms of moving forward. I'm interested in that. Uh, I don't know that that's the case on the official level. So very good presentations, and thank you. Okay, question. <clears throat> yeah, so I, a fascinating panel. Uh, Dan Roberts from The Guardian. I, um, uh, it seems to me, in a world where the internet and globalization is demolishing borders, whether governments like it or not, that, that getting the politics to catch up is, 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 is vital. And um, so I, I'd like to take the thought experiment perhaps a bit more seriously than, uh, than some, not seriously, but, but, but I'd like to kind of look at the big uh, idea of a merger and go back to Diane and ask you, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on what you think the US would gain from a merger? You talked very persuasively, I thought, about what Canada could gain from a merger. H how would it benefit um, uh, America, and, and, and what what would it do to the dynamics we're seeing in Washington at the moment, where already uh, the, the the country is struggling to accommodate all these very diverse uh, demands? How how, how would uh, how would they accommodate uh, a, a another country in there? Well, I, first of all, I think the the most realistic merger is the economic merger, more of an economic merger. If you have that happening, that means that Canada has finally gotten its attitude straight concerning its future, and its future being with the partner to the south. Uh, they, and, and on the trade side, too, it's interesting to note that Canada is not an exporting nation. It exports a lot, but it's 80% of its exports are intercorporate transfers between American branch plants and American parents. And that's about as high as Sweden. Sweden has the same problem. So as far as the idea of going out and finding export markets are concerned, this, is not, this has not been Canada's, again, another uh, indication of the, the fact that the merger is well, well underway between the two countries. Um, the the straight-up benefits for a better relationship than we have now, whatever, however you want to characterize that, I think getting rid of the border, uh, what that does is it gives mobility uh, to American businesses. It would open up the resource area 
more than before. If you get rid of the border, I have a whole chapter on synergies, the low-hanging fruit that someone referred to. Uh, you, could, you could develop hydro cross-border hydroelectric uh, power, tidal, all kinds of projects that could uh, make, make the two countries, well, certainly the United States, could completely eliminate any imports of oil from anywhere else and also clean up the environment. You could uh, ration out the water to enhance your agribusiness. You could have the synergies of techn techn technological advance. Uh, right now, yes, there's 250 or 300,000 Canadians in Silicon Valley, but there's a whole bunch more that would go if they could go. Uh, but there are a lot of constraints on immigration, on being legal uh, and doing that down there. Vice versa. I would submit there would be a lot of Americans who would probably be happy to live in parts of Canada. So you'd get business opportunities, you'd get economic growth, you'd get huge synergies uh, economically, um, and you would also get um, the, the possibility of the build out of the Arctic. Uh, and the Americans, this is, this is an enormous cost. There's not rail, road, seaports, anything in the Arctic. And just to undertake some of the build out for infrastructure that would enhance development and exploration, very large parts of it haven't even been stepped on by a human being, uh, would, be, uh, would be an enormous driver, just as the Eisenhower Highway System was, to the economy. It would be a Marshall Plan of the hinterland of Canada that the United States could fully participate on. Uh, it would be jobs. Um, and then, and then, of course, geopolitically, there would be no one even close to them in terms of influence and clout. Is that, is that helpful? And another person mentioned something quite cute. If you actually uh, politically merge the two, uh, Canadians become the fabric softener <laughs> for the United States, which is to your point about universal health care, the fleecy, if you like. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mac Dessler, University of Maryland. Very interesting panel. Uh, I want to, like the last questioner, want to push uh, our creator of this uh, wonderful controversy a little bit more. Everybody sort of, you and everybody have sort of dismissed the sen political scenarios for integration without talking about them at all. And um, I, therefore, those of us who haven't had the privilege yet of reading the book, haven't any idea what those ideas might be. Uh, in terms of what the s you mentioned, there are yeah, I, political I, scenarios, even though you recognize I, they I are the talk a I talk a lot about it in the book. So you get. So if you do it, give us uh, give us a capsule summary of okay. maybe a couple for of Republican Republicans like the security benefits of a merger. The Republicans would like the economic benefits of a merger, um, and 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 the access to resources and and all of that that a merger would bring. The Democrats. Uh, would 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 like it because there's 35 million Democrats in Canada. <laughs> they just think that would be great. Um, so so you've got uh, you've got that kind of situation. I did not talk in the book. I assumed that in my thought experiment that the best the the only viable model would be to become states in the United States. So you'd add 13 states to the U.S. mix. Uh, Quebec would probably balk, then you make them a commonwealth status like Puerto Rico with their own president, their own official language, some more autonomy. You know, I just threw out these ideas. Rewriting, constitu rewriting uh, two constitutions and blending them into one is impossible. The Germans didn't even attempt that. What they did was they said the only thing that would work is we will amend the West German constitution and the East German lander will come in under accession clauses, which are in place in the U.S. Constitution, by the way. Uh, anybody can accede into the U.S. Constitution by a simple majority of Congress. There's not even a presidential happened quite, thing happened involved. Happened quite a lot in our past. So this, all of this is, is possible, uh, but I think you need a crisis for this to happen, uh, or it doesn't. And so does, is that helpful? I think yeah, a, a yeah. other interesting structure is, of course, what you do is you get a security perimeter in place. In order to do a security perimeter, now you have a blending of customs, taxation, homeland security, police interdiction, and, and immigration. Now you've got a fourth level of government, whether you want to call it that or not. You've got, or you've got binational institutions that babysit and watchdog those different areas. 
And so now you start to get into a blending and maybe a higher level of government. We already have, I think, 300 treaties oh, yeah, between the two countries. I mean, and there's commissions and there's tribunals and, you know, we already have a structure for binational government. In the back, David Jones and then this. I'm Dave Jones. I am a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer. The uh, throwaway line uh, used to be that uh, Canadians are unarmed Americans uh, with uh, health care. Uh, nobody mentioned here at all the problems that would be associated with uh, extending the Second Amendment uh, into any sort of a combined uh, North America. But on top of that, there is another issue which nobody really addressed seriously, which is the incredibly obstructive effort uh, by environmentalists throughout uh, North America to prevent uh, economic uh, development of the sort that uh, we are all touting would be the uh, uh, say epitome of what a merger would be. I'm willing to argue that uh, the only way that one would deal uh, with uh, aboriginal Let's see, uh, Native America concerns would be if everyone who was not an Aboriginal North America departed, and not only that would satisfy uh, this element uh, of the inhabitants of North America. But that's another debatable point. Nevertheless, uh, there are the serious problems of environmental obstructionism and how one would cope uh, with Second Amendment uh, U.S. rights whenever anyone should think about uh, this type of merger. Yeah, good questions. Um, you know, and, and this, is, this is brought up uh, all the time. Um, Canadians have a right to own a gun, but, but, but they don't have it enshrined in the Constitution. Anybody can own a gun in Canada. A anybody can drive a car in Canada, but we have driver's licenses, and the registry is gone on the gun side now, but we have more controls on on the retail side and the purchase of a gun, there's a waiting period of cooling off, a checking. Um, the United States has the Second Amendment and you know, I don't know why guns aren't the same as cars. You should have a license to drive a car so you don't, are not a danger to society. You should have a license to, to have a gun or be checked out anyway. Now, no, that being you. said, that being said, I don't think it's an issue because if it is an issue, the merger doesn't happen. That's all. Uh, I don't think it's that big an issue, and, and I have some polling on the gun control versus the right to bear arms, and those are two different issues in the public mind, and gun controls in the U.S. poll as high as they do in Canada, and Canadians were very much against the gun registry, and that was scrapped by the current government, and I don't see any grassroots movement to bring that back. Now, the crime rates have a lot to do with socio socioeconomic conditions. Uh, in, in both countries, and uh, that, that's a different issue. On the environmental side, um, my next book is going to be out of Silicon Valley. Um, I, th I could make a good case and argue that in maybe one generation for sure and two, we will not need fossil fuels anymore. But fossil fuels isn't what you've got in Canada. You've got all the other metals and minerals you need to make iPads, hybrid cars, cars, all kinds of things like that. It's not just about oil. In fact, the oil sands is the only real big bunch of energy uh, deposit in, in Canada. I would say that, uh, you know, by 2030, uh, with solar panel uh, development, we could be uh, past the age of fossil fuels by 2030 or 2035. And it's not a problem. <clears throat> we save the planet, too. <laughs> Irene Beckenstein, University of Maryland. We've talked about uh, political and economic uh, factors, but what about the, uh, the personal, that Americans are notorious for not thinking much or knowing much about Canada, but it's obviously different on the other side of the border. I was in Canada on 9-11, and the people around me acted as if they had been attacked. But what, how would they feel about having their identity subsumed no longer being considered Canadians, but uh, Americans. Well, I think at first blush, people are resistant to it. And that's why it's a thought experiment. I'm talking about these are forms of integration that you can go. I mean, I have five economic models of integration. One is an investment banking model where we just, you know, exchange money and, and that sort of thing. Um, I would say that Canadians are voting with their feet. 
there's three million living in the United States, and there's probably five, another two million, and there's an enormous number of other people that come and go. And I think nationalism is important, but it's, it, it's based on at what point and at what level. And if you have an economic situation or you have a social situation or a political situation that requires you to change your um, loyalty or change your government, people will do that. But it is, it is an issue, absolutely. It is an issue, uh, and, and uh, that would have to be overcome if anything were to happen. That's why I think if there's a crisis, political union like Germany, if there's no crisis, I think we move toward a European model. This brings up a, a point. I think you alluded to it earlier that, <clears throat> that as a thought experiment, I think most of the people in this room are like, huh, this is kind of interesting, and sort of pursuing this line of thought and letting it go through. My Canadian friends are just apoplectic about this book. They won't even entertain the idea. My children are idea. horrified. <laughs> they horrified. won't no, even entertain the idea. <clears throat> it's like, you're having that kook Diane Francis? It's an interesting thought, but I'm just wondering if you could sort of go a little bit deeper into um, the, how this has been received in Canada and in the United States. Because it seems pretty rational here. It's totally rational. Uh, and it, Canadians are, um, I have two of them. Um, Canadians are um, very much tinged with the anti-American attitude. There is no question. And then also there's the difference in style. Uh, I had an interesting chat with a friend of mine, and he runs an investment banking boutique. And he has an office in New York and an office in Toronto. And I said, so I guess you do the closing parties completely differently. And he said, no, I don't. What do you mean? He said, I don't know what to do when there's a closing in the US. I said, well, what you do is you make t-shirts up and you go around and say, we're number one and we killed those guys and let's bury the next guys and that's your way of doing it. Uh, in Canada, that's not done, that's unseemly. That's good, good job, chaps, nice, well done. <laughs> and you know, let's, let's hope we fare okay in the next year. And so there's that, that gloating that, you know, America, it really rubs people the wrong way in Canada. And so that is what it is. We're dealing with stereotypes. But we're also dealing with, with an actual difference, too, in style. And so that's, that's why, um, you know, my, my kids just, they see uh, the Olympics and they, you know, the bragging and the gloating, they just, it just turns them right off. Jill? <clears throat> Thank you for uh, this presentation. I'm Jill Gauthier from the Kenyan Embassy, so I won't comment on the on the overall proposition from a political <laughs> merger. Of course not. I'll be out of job, but <laughs> but more more to uh, the the question of uh, of uh, the economic and market integration. Why is it that in Canada there is an immense support? for market integration with the U.S., with economic integration, huge support, whereas in the U.S. it's basically unknown or very little support. Uh, in fact, the, the, the poll says that uh, about uh, 12 to 15 percent of Americans know that uh, Canada is their biggest trading partner. So it's very, very, very uh, uh, little knowledge. So I hope you're very successful. You said you're getting a lot of invites across the United States, so maybe that's a message that you can uh, certainly help to convey to, uh, to our, our American colleagues. But maybe, you know, it, why is it that in the, in, even in the business community there's not more uh, leadership in terms of recognition of the market integration? Why is it that we will not, for instance, promote some ideas like uh, product of North America? This is the new brand a new brand as opposed to uh, the, 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 you know, going in a different way. These are things that might change a bit the mindset about the benefits of the market and uh, the, the, the economic integration, and then that could help move along some of the uh, smaller, smaller initiatives that you have in your book to, to facilitate and then do away with the border in some shape or form. Yeah, I, th I think you make a good point, and you're, you're from Quebec, and it's interesting that in the free trade election of 88, overwhelming support and still comes from Quebec. And I think when you are a more homogeneous, cohesive place, a nation like Quebec, a nation within a country, you're not frightened. You want bigger markets. You want to go for it. If you think 
and this is the old British tape. If you think that the Yankee is a problem and we're going to get subsumed and we're completely decapitated because of it, then you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it at all. And I think it's really down at that, that <coughs> psychological level. Um, the number of people, and, and being American, you know, in Canada, uh, and I was married to a British guy for, for a long time with Canadian children, and, you know, I know how to behave. I behave differently, and so I'm kind of an invisible immigrant. And you won't believe the insults, the offensive comments about Americans that I've had to put up with the whole time. <laughs> I mean, if I was uh, any other ethnic group, I would have gone to Human Rights Commission. Um, <laughs> but of course, that's silly. But it really, it, there is an undercurrent there, and it's kind of a smugness. Uh, and, and you see that in Britain, you see that in Canada, and I think that's very unfortunate. I think it's, I think it's very destructive. Um, and so one of the reasons I did this book, which you will appreciate, is I wanted to attack the Canadian establishment and say, wake up, there is one underway, let's manage it to our benefit and, and attack American ignorance about Canada. And there's a couple of polls in the book about American understanding of Canada and, and polling about a merger. And it's real interesting. The closer the American is to the border, obviously, the more they know about Canada, the more they're fine. Let's get rid of the border. The security perimeter polling is 75% in Canada in favor of getting rid of the border. 75%. So, you know, these are the things that our grassroots are down there, but it's really, really hard to break through at the top. And the media in Canada, in English Canada, the CBC, the Globe and Mail, are very, very, they always have that tinge of anti-Americanism, and that's not helpful. <clears throat> I'm Peter Bogart from the German Institute of uh, Global and Area Studies. First, a footnote, uh, we are known from Hamburg to be more British than the British, so the <laughs> Germanness of America and the Britishness of Canada shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one issue which was just mentioned, and that is, uh, you are sitting beside the biggest nation of the world with all the responsibility and all the unpopularity. So you ask yourself, well, yes, let's uh, integrate economically, that's fine, but there's no reason does, you know, to share all these tremendous burdens, which nobody likes. And uh, uh, so this, this burden obviously is for Canadians, if I would be one, which I would think twice and say, let's do all the economic things and economists anyway, but politically, Yes, support uh, what America does, what we believe to, but keep our own independence. And we have one example, even in the economic scene, the financial crisis. Canada was the one who totally was able to avoid it. Right there, looking at the US, going into a big mess. So you wonder. Well, it, as I say, uh, the, the German-style union only happened because of a crisis in Germany, and it'll only happen here. Uh, there was a really great quote that I used. The first quote in my book is from a, a historian, a Canadian historian named Jack Granitstein. And he, he, I think he nailed it. He said, Canadians are Americans who don't want to be U.S. citizens. <laughs> Kent, you wanted? I just had a, a couple other questions for Diane. And coming from the perspective of assuming the merger has taken place, are Canadians aware of how different the identity of individual states are in the United States? You alluded to Texas. But you know with regard to Mexico, there's been a big debate about building a wall along the Mexican border. Oregonians have long favored a wall right along that California border. <laughs> <laughs> so that there is a strong state identity. And Oregonians are quite different than Alabamans who are different in turn than New Yorkers. The second question, again, assuming this merger has taken place, and there's an example of a kind of growing Anglo sphere, at least in terms of language, I sense that you also had some neo-Churchillian tendencies, thinking that, what about Australia and New Zealand? Wouldn't they like to join? And if the United Kingdom should decide to leave the European community, it made me think uh, back to 1976, the United States was celebrating 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, and The Economist magazine, the one international magazine that likes the United States, 
had a picture of the Continental Congress and then in that colonial script, be it hereby resolved that the United Kingdom shall be the 51st of these United States. So could you see that? We're now uh, U.S. Canada. We have a, a new brand, as, as uh, you suggested, and we're now looking out. And why not have uh, the United Kingdom join? Well, yeah, exactly. Why not? Uh, why not why not do anything um, and I think that those are politically driven issues uh, and you know you've got the let's face it most of the world's boundaries were imposed by col colonial powers that bear no resemblance to the ethnicities religious uh, cohesiveness of, of the people involved uh, if you look at the Middle East, that is being rationalized right now. Syria was three kingdoms. Uh, Jordan has three tribes. Uh, none of it makes sa sense. And the subcontinent, uh, South Asian, uh, the French-English situation in Canada, and, and on and on and on it goes. So as those things get reevaluated and rationalized, yeah. Uh, I, f I find the Scottish... Uh, secession movement very in intriguing and uh, that is going to uh, by the way they're using the Quebec playbook mm -hmm. they meet they're using the Quebec playbook uh, meaning oh we won't get rid of the monarchy or the Constitution and we will keep the British pound in this case the Canadian dollar but we want to be independent and of course the British are being a little tougher minded than the Canadians were in the lead up to the 95 referendum in Canada but, um, you know, I think that uh, these pressures are going to be constant because none of the boundaries really make sense. Well, that's just time. I'd like to thank the audience for good questions and Kevin and Michael and Chris and Kent for their really neat observations. But most of all, Diane, for coming to talk with us, sharing these ideas and really getting us thinking today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Americans thinking more about we do just take Canada for granted because it's not a priority. It's, it's, it's not a problem. And suddenly Ukraine's be. a problem. Or North Korea rattles their nuclear saber again, and that's a problem. And 